the one crowning accomplishment that the Jews have always longed to do is to rebuild the temple. In fact, they look forward to rebuilding the third temple. I stood at the base of the Western Wall some years ago and talked to the archaeologist in charge of the diggings there. And I asked him, why are you doing all these diggings? He said, we're preparing for the building of the third temple. When I asked him, when do you plan to start the construction? He said, the Messiah will build a temple when he comes. So the Jews are looking for the Messiah to come. They're looking forward to rebuilding the temple, a crowning accomplishment. Revelation chapter 11 gives us the story of that. And Gary Stimmen is here to discuss with me this awesome future event. And indeed it is awesome and uh, of great historical importance. It will be one of the, uh, as J.R. mentioned, crowning achievements of all time. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And, and we have there two verses, uh, Revelation 11, 1 and 2, and J.R., in those two verses there is a wealth of material to discuss. Now one of the first things I want you to notice is that the Gentiles are treading the city underfoot for 42 months. We have Gentiles in control of the Temple Mount to this very day. And so it is not unlike the present situation for the Jews uh, to take advantage of this. And we don't know exactly how they're going to return to the Temple Mount. But Gary, in recent days, one of the Knesset members has been uh, leading a charge, uh, a march to the Temple Mount and uh, in hopes of bringing this very uh, situation to the forefront of the news. That's right. As a matter of fact, uh, there is a great movement among uh, uh, several members of the Knesset who are uh, members of religious parties, including Shas and Harut and others, uh, who recently led a demonstration to the Temple Mount with the blessing of the Israeli police. They want to build the temple. And we have always thought that the temple would be built perhaps under kind of a peaceful situation after they came back and, and maybe uh, all of the opponents would be cleared away and the Jews would be given carte blanche to go ahead and go up there and measure it and rebuild it. But uh, here in Revelation, it doesn't seem like that's true. The Gentiles are still there. I've heard a lot of theologians say that something will bring the Muslim mosque down. Mm. Maybe a misplaced bomb or an earthquake. But that doesn't have to be the case, does it? It does not have to be the case. And it appears that there is some mitigating force. Uh, and we would have to say uh, perhaps a person has arrived who has, can, has brought together the feuding parties and somehow brought together this miraculous uh, accomplishment in which the Gentiles are on that Temple Mount and the Jews are up there too and they're operating together in peace, which we don't see happening today, but by, the, by Revelation 11, by the time that comes around, it happens. Now we are told by the Mufti, the Muslim authorities in Jerusalem, that the Jews will never be allowed on that Temple Mount. And yet, here we find John measuring an area marked off for the construction of a Jewish sanctuary, a place of Jewish worship on the mountain. Ezekiel also has something to say about this. In fact, Ezekiel describes a wall being built to make a separation between the sanctuary, that would be the Jewish sanctuary, and a profane place. Uh, that would be chapter 42, last verse of Ezekiel. A profane place. Gary, there's a profane place there on that mountain to this very day. Absolutely, uh, J.R. In fact, uh, uh, archaeologist Lean Rittmeyer uh, discovered a large square, uh, 500 cubits on a side, that is really the center of the Temple Mount. It goes back to Solomonic days. And J.R., not only did he determine the length of the cubit from that, but he also was easily able to determine the place of the Holy of Holies. 
It happens to be right under what we would call a profane place, uh, which happens to be the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock. And rabbis for years, centuries, have said that the Mosque of Omar is the abomination of desolation. Well, we know it's an abomination, and yes. it certainly has made the place desolate to Jewish worship. So anything that would cause Jews not to be able to go up there and, and worship is a, a desolate place, May, a, a place that makes it desolate. But we have a prophecy, and we have an alternative, something that describes how this seemingly very unlikely situation can take place. Uh, measuring the temple of God. First of all, J.R., let's discuss the word temple because when you think of a temple, you think of a huge place, uh, steps in the front and lots of rooms and a very, very large place. That's really not what we're talking about here, is it? That's right. You know, when Ezekiel measured the temple area, he t takes him several chapters, several verses. He says, we measured this and it's so many cubits and we measured that and it's so many reeds and we measured this and that. goes around and around. But here, John is simply told to measure the temple and uh, no measurements are listed. Right. So it must be a very small place. In fact, the Greek word here uh, refers to a small holy place rather than a large temple with several rooms. That's right. There are two Greek words uh, commonly translated temple. Hieron uh, means a large temple of the type that we described a moment ago. The word used here is naon or naos, which refers to a small place, uh, the holy place, or as it would be described in the Old Testament, the holy of holies. And so uh, what we are doing here is setting up the holy of holies along with the altar. In other words, a minimal kind of a setup, not the full-blown uh, court that we associate with the tabernacle of, of Moses and of David. Since 1984, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem has been building the implements, or tools of the temple, <laughs> preparing for a restoration of temple worship. And all of their tools are small. The brazen altar has handles, Gary. Mm -hmm. They can grab it and run if they have to. <laughs> yes. So uh, it looks like it's going to be a very rather Spartan thing. Uh, preparing for and looking forward to the coming of the Messiah who will then build a magnificent temple and his own palace when he becomes King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But we have here the sim simply the measuring of an own. And then he says measure the altar and uh, Gary if it were the uh, altar of incense it would be inside the temple. If it's the brazen altar, it would be outside, and that's what appears to be here. If he measures the temple, then he measures the altar. It has to be something outside the temple, not inside. Mm -hmm. And then he says, measure the worshipers. Well, obviously this must be the courtyard, the area for the worshipers to come and worship. Now, J.R., the uh, brazen altar is a symbol of judgment. It is a place where the large burnt offerings uh, were brought before the Lord. and. Uh, they were brought as sacrifices uh, acceptable to the Lord. And that would appear to be the altar we're talking about here in Revelation 11. Mm -hmm. And it may be a rather large altar. In fact, Israel today has built a brazen altar out in the desert. It may not be out of brass, but it's, it's an altar the same size as the one that was used in the temple where they are training priests in the liturgy of using the brazen altar. So the altar could be rather large. Now, I want to go over to uh, Amos chapter 9 because Amos tells us that in that day, which he said in earlier chapters was the day of the Lord, uh, that God would raise again the tabernacle of David that is fallen, close up the breaches thereof, raise up its ruins as in the days of old. And this sounds like what is happening here. It's a it's the simple tent that David used to house the Ark of the Covenant before Solomon built the temple. And the Ark of the Covenant was kept in that tent until Solomon finished the temple and then it was removed, taken into the temple, into the Holy of Holies. This seems to be the interim temple. It does, J.R., and we take this not as metaphor, 
but as actual fact. In other words, uh, I know I believe, and I'm sure that J.R. does, we've discussed this many times, we believe that the Tabernacle of David actually exists somewhere. It has been folded up very carefully, put back, preserved for that future day, and the day is getting close. Now, where's the Ark of the Covenant been? And by the way, if John's going to measure a temple here, doesn't mention the Ark of the Covenant, but obviously, if there's going to be a place of worship, they have to have the central object of that worship, and that would be the Ark. So where's it been, and when's it going to return? Well, we'll share that with you when we return in just a moment. The Ark of the Covenant disappeared from world history somewhere around the 6th to 7th century B.C. It is believed that it was taken out of the temple when the son of Hezekiah, the wicked king Manasseh, put an idol in the Holy of Holies, an idol to, or grove to Asherah. And the, uh, the various gods of the Babylonian pantheon of gods around on the Temple Mount. It was idolatry in its finest hour, Gary. And they took the Ark of the Covenant and left town. As a matter of fact, uh, Jeremiah is very specific about that, J.R. He, he mentions in rather cryptic language, but he does indeed mention the fact that the priesthood sort of drifted south along the King's Highway. Uh, went right over into Egypt and then south through Egypt and took uh, their worship with them in an effort to save it. They, they even went so far, uh, we know, as to build a temple down there, and there is very good historical evidence that they had the ark with them. That temple was located on the island of Elephantine in the Nile River just below what is today the Aswan Dam. But around 410 B.C., the Egyptians tore down that Jewish temple and told the Jews they were no longer welcome in Egypt, at which time they turned south and went down into Ethiopia, settled on an island on Lake Tana, the island of Kirkos. And there they erected a tent, according to Ethiopian history, and put the Ark of the Covenant under it. It was there under the tent for 700 years. Gary, it's possible that tent was the tabernacle of David. If so, no wonder Amos says that it has breaches and ruins. <laughs> Indeed, it's been patched and repatched, but you know, J.R., uh, it would have been made of linen, among other things, uh, and uh, there are examples of fabrics that have, have lasted that long. And something as, as uh, valuable and something as wonderful as this tabernacle uh, has been preserved under special circumstances. I'm convinced it, it's got to be in the realm of the miraculous. But there's good reason to believe that perhaps it came up from Ethiopia, maybe in recent years. Yeah, you know, there is a story floating around that the Israeli Mossad and, and IDF took an unmarked plane down to Ethiopia, paid off some Ethiopians with $42,000 or maybe it was $42 million. Nobody knows for sure, but it was a lot of money to them. And uh, they took it uh, to Europe, left town, and gave the uh, ark, supposedly, to the Israelis, who then, of course, had men who are derivative of the tribe of Levi to carry the ark on board a plane and hold it on their shoulders while the plane took off and brought it back home to Israel. Now, we can't confirm that story. It's, a, it's just one of those stories floating around, but it is kind of interesting. Oh, by the way, the 42,000 or 42 million, or 40, 420,000, whatever it was, was counterfeit money. So <laughs> the Ethiopians <laughs> got stuck in the end. Nevertheless, it appears to be back in Israel, under wraps, waiting for that day when it will be brought out. It just you know, seems like everything is sort of in limbo right now, waiting until that time when the Jews will be allowed to go up on the Temple Mount. At this point, we don't know, Gary, if they're ever going to make it, except the Bible says they will. The Bible says they will. It's going to be some kind of a very miraculous setting. Uh, J.R., the Jerusalem uh, Temple Institute uh, has been working assiduously since uh, the mid-'80s. They've produced the tools for temple worship, including uh, the golden menorah, 
and there is every reason to believe that they expect to be doing temple worship soon. In fact, JR, what's interesting to me is that they are now training Levites and that they are prepared should that tabernacle of David be taken out of storage, they're instantly ready. They have the red heifer too. Mm -hmm. They do. Uh, the heifer was born back in April. That's right. I think around the 1st of April. Now, the Amos passage, which says that in that day I will raise again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen. That would be in verses 11 and 12. If you back up, I think, to verse 7, it says, uh, you're like the Ethiopians to me, you children of Israel. Well, now, you know, that sounds like uh, a clue as to where the ark is going to be found. It does, doesn't it? In Ethiopia and brought back home. In the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, there is a meeting held at Jerusalem over the conversion of Gentiles. The Apostle Paul had been winning Gentiles hand over fist up in what is called today Turkey, in Asia Minor. And uh, when they came back to to tell of this wonderful experience of the conversion of Gentiles, some of the Pharisees, which believed and were members of the, of the Church of Jerusalem, took issue with Paul. They said, you're going to have to make those Gentiles be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Well, this stirred up a controversy, and it had to be settled and was in Acts chapter 15. Peter told about Cornelius, the Roman centurion, who received the Holy Spirit without ever having kept a single Mosaic law. And so the obvious conclusion is Gentiles are saved by grace. Mm. <laughs> and Jews are too, by the way, but I, I just want to throw that in. But here we have James in uh, verses 13 and following of Acts 15 talking about this tabernacle of David and all these Gentiles who are getting saved. Tell us about it, Gary. Well, here he quotes uh, Amos uh, chapter 9, as we have mentioned earlier, and, and uh, Acts 15, 16 says, After this I will return, will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, I'll build again the ruins thereof, and will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. Now what's interesting, J.R., is there's a very slight variation in this quotation where it says, I will return and will build up the tabernacle, tabernacle of David that, or in order that, the residue of men might seek after the Lord. Slightly different mm -hmm. wording. Yes, in the Amos passage, uh, it is quoted as the remnant possessing Edom. And in this passage, it's the residue of men seeking the Lord. Uh, this remnant, of course, being uh, the same as residue. Mm -hmm. But in the Amos passage, the, it sounds like they're possessing Edom or making a military foray into southern Jordan. But that doesn't appear to be uh, logical. If you're setting up the tabernacle, what are you going to be doing? R running out to possess Edom? or seeking the Lord. <laughs> well, my vote comes down on the, the remnant of Adam, uh, because you see Adam and Edom happen to be spelled the same way in Hebrew. And so what we really have here, it appears, is the remnant of, of uh, Adam, or men, seeking the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. Yes. So uh, there's all those Gentiles that uh, Peter and Paul were talking about and the Pharisees were fussing over. And you know what's interesting, we started out in Revelation 11 verses 1 and 2 uh, where we read these words, but the court which is without the, gen uh, without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it's given to the Gentiles. And you know, J.R., we have that temple, that, that is that holy place set up it surely must be the tabernacle of David, and it has something to do with the Gentiles as well as the Jews. In other words, it's a, a, a place of salvation. Now, you know, we, we know that there's going to be Gentiles upon whom the Lord's name is called um, there to watch the setting up of the tabernacle. It's possible that we will see this occur before the rapture.
However, the rapture is imminent, and I, can tell, I could not tell you that these Gentiles are us. But in the final analysis, as John measures the temple, and they worship there, um, as I mentioned at the beginning or the outset of this program, that's a crowning accomplishment. Well, Gary, this chapter 11 just happens to correspond with the 11th letter of the Hebrew language, the Kaf, which means crowning accomplishment. <laughs> so we have here a fascinating study as we move through the verses of Revelation. We'll be back in just a moment. This temple that will someday be constructed uh, should be nothing more than a tent, the tabernacle of David reestablished on the Temple Mount, perhaps with United Nations soldiers on either side or surrounding the area in order to allow the Jews worship. However, that is the very place where the Antichrist is going to commit the abomination of desolation, Gary. Absolutely, and it all takes place on Mount Zion, downtown Jerusalem, the Holy Temple Mount. Keep watching the newspapers. That's the most important spot on the globe, prophetically speaking. I once asked uh, the temple builder, the people who want to build a temple today, um, about the building of the temple. They said, yes, we'll build it soon. I said, well, don't you know the Antichrist is going to commit the abomination of desolation? Oh, no, he said, we'd never let him do that. <laughs> well, keep your eyes on the skies. Jesus is coming soon. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For your gift of $10, you can receive a special edition of our current program on audio tape, or for a gift of $20, we'll send you our programs on videotape. For either order, call the 800 number on your screen right now. <laughs> 